Hello everyone, my name is Allison Mail. I'm an instructor at the DNA Learning Center. Welcome to DNA LC Live, DNA Barcoding Part 2. Um, as I said, this is Part 2 of a DNA Barcoding Wet Lab series. So if you haven't seen Part 1 presented by my colleague Sharon Pepinella, I highly encourage you to check out Dr. Pepinella's recording. Um, you can search through our YouTube channel or our DNA LC Live page to see that. But if you want to stick with me here for Part 2, I will do a recap of what she talked about in part one as well. Um, I first wanted to just do a quick introduction to the DNA Learning Center and DNA LC Live. So in case you aren't so familiar with us, the DNA Learning Center is a part of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which is a research institution in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. The DNA Learning Center brings um, material about genetics and biology to students in Long Island, New York City, and now in Sleepy Hollow as well. So right now we're doing this new series called DNA LC Live, where we're bringing you live streamed videos of lab demonstrations and discussions of interesting DNA related topics. And I hope that you are enjoying those. I also have at the bottom of the screen here, our social media channels. So I encourage you to follow us on all of those so you don't miss any of our upcoming events. All right, so let's get started talking about DNA bar. She's gonna use this as a remote, there we go. Okay, so what Dr. Pepinella talked about in part one um, is that DNA barcoding is a way that we think about how living organisms are organized. So scientists organize living organisms into groups based on their shared characteristics. But defining a species is actually very complex, um, especially if you're basically looking only at the shape of the organism or what they look like, their morphology. And traditional methods using taxonomy are really difficult for non-experts. The terminology is very complex. Uh, bits of organisms or juvenile organisms, things that are damaged can be very hard to identify. Uh, traditional methods of identifying organisms are also very slow. And we only have really estimates of the true number of species that are on Earth. And many species are threatened or endangered, and we're actually losing species at a rate faster than we can identify them. So this is where DNA barcoding comes in. DNA barcoding can be used to potentially identify different species. Um, it can be used by non-experts to identify different types of species, and it's usually pretty rapid compared to traditional methods. So Dr. Pepinella introduced you to these things in part one. Um, and she showed you a rapid method of DNA isolation. Um, I'm going to continue with this lab and show you what we do with that DNA, but I just wanted to be sure to mention that there are other ways to isolate DNA other than the method that we showed you in part one. There's also a method we use often at the DNA Learning Center called a silica DNA isolation, and there are other commercial kits available. So there's a silica isolation kit available from Carolina Biological. Uh, we partner with them to provide reagents for classes who may be interested in doing this when you go back to school. Sharon also introduced you to the idea of universal DNA barcodes. So these are little sections of DNA that scientists used universally, pretty universally at least, to identify different types of species. So in plants, we often use the RBCL gene or the Rubisco gene. And in animals, including invertebrates, we often use CO1. So these are the two examples that we're going to continue using in this part of the series, um, as that's what we started with in part one. And hopefully, as I explained today, a lot more about PCR, you'll understand what we were talking about when we said, these are regions of the DNA that are similar enough amongst different organisms that they can be used for PCR, but different enough that they can be used to identify new species and not necessarily just new species, and identify a species in a group. So polymerase chain reaction, this is the big technique that I'm going to talk about today. This is the ability to make many copies of one specific region of DNA. We don't want to look at the DNA of the entire organism. We don't want to look at the whole genome of any of these organisms. That's a lot of data, and a lot of it would be uninformative. So to make things easier for ourselves, to save time, we just look at these little DNA barcodes. If you're familiar with the way DNA gets replicated inside of cells during cellular replication, um, this is going to be pretty familiar to you already. The concept behind PCR mimics DNA replication in an in vitro environment. So we're going to do this in a tube, but it works a lot the same way that DNA replication already happens inside of your cells or any organism's cells. 
So you can see here at the bottom, I have a little diagram from Wikipedia, um, but I'm gonna go through one of our animations on the DNA Learning Center website that I think makes it a little bit more clear as you actually see the pieces of DNA moving around on the screen. And hopefully after I do that and explain it some more, uh, PCR will be very clear to everyone who's watching. It's a really important molecular technique that gets used for things other than DNA barcoding. Okay, before we go into the animation though, I like to start with making an analogy. And the analogy I usually use in my classrooms is making uh, copies of DNA is just like making copies of a section of a book. So usually I hold up a textbook to my students and say, okay, if I wanted you to copy just one part of this textbook, what would you need? So you can think about what you would say if I said, okay, what do you need to copy one section of this textbook? Because again, maybe I don't want the whole textbook, I just want one chapter. Um, and similarly with PCR, we're only copying one little section of the DNA. So one of the first things that you would need to make copies of a section of a book is a copy machine. Sometimes my students will say, oh, I need a pen. I say, no, 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 I want this to look exactly the same. And if you're trying to write by hand, it's not gonna look exactly the same. So we would use a copy machine, a copier, some, something like that, a scanner and a computer so that we could copy exactly what the book looks like. Okay, what else would we need if we were trying to copy part of um, a textbook? Well, we would need paper and ink to put into the copy machine. We need the materials that the book is actually made out of, right? We don't need all the materials if we're not copying like the cover and the bindings, but we need paper and ink, the materials that the book is made out of. Okay. You also need the book itself. It would be very hard if I handed a textbook, held up a textbook here in the video, it would be very hard for you to copy that textbook wherever you are watching this video. So you would need a copy of the book, the physical book that you're trying to copy. You need some sort of bookmarks. It could be page numbers instead of a bookmark. It could be sticky notes sticking out the side of the book. You need some indication of which pages I want copied. If I just handed you a book and said, copy part of this, you might not know which section I actually want. So in order to have the section that's informative for me, you need some sort of indication like a bookmark of what pages I want you to copy. And the one that sometimes my students don't come up with right away is you need electricity. So if they're not thinking of this, sometimes I stand in the middle of the classroom and say, okay, what if I opened up and put a copier right here in the middle of the room, would it work? No, it needs to be plugged in. Um, and I would also add to this, uh, you need the right environment for the copier to work. The copier probably wouldn't work very well if we put it outside in the middle of the street where it was getting hit by cars, getting rained on, anything like that. Okay, so you might be able to think of some other things um, that you would need to copy a book. You might have come up with a slightly different list, but let's work with this list moving forward and think about what the equivalent is in PCR. If you were trying to make copies of a specific section of DNA. Even if you don't know that much about PCR yet, you can think about what these might be. So what is the copy machine? This is gonna be a molecular machine that makes copies of DNA. And again, if you're familiar with DNA replication in cells, you might already have thought of this. Um, it's also in the name PCR. So what it is, is a polymerase. And more specifically, it's a DNA polymerase to make copies of DNA. So it's gonna make chains of DNA. In PCR, we specifically use a piece of uh, polymerase called TAP polymerase. I'm gonna talk more about what TAP polymerase is after the next couple of slides, um, but you can think about what might be a problem as we learn more about PCR if we try to use human polymerase. It would of course be able to copy human DNA. It would also be able to copy animal DNA or plant DNA, but why might that be difficult in PCR? As we go through the steps of PCR, that will become more clear. Okay, so for paper and ink, what are the materials that DNA is made up of that you need to put into this reaction in order for the polymerase to build up the, the new DNA? Well, these would be nucleotides, right? So it's made, DNA is made up, unfortunately, I didn't bring um, one of our DNA models home with me, but if you've watched any of our other DNA LC live streams, you've probably seen some of our other instructors showing you these beautiful models we have. And you can think about the parts in the middle, or if you just think about what DNA looks like, we have bases. Those are A, C, T, and G is usually how we abbreviate them. And they're attached to a sugar on the backbone in DNA. This is specifically deoxyribose and a phosphate group on the backbone. And all three of those things together, a base, a sugar, and a phosphate group are called a nucleotide. Now, when we put these into our PCR, um, we actually use something that's abbreviated here as DNTPs. 
So the D stands for deoxy because we could also do this for RNA. Um, and it's NTP stands for nucleoside triphosphate. That's just a little bit more specific technical name for what we actually put into the reaction, which is actually a base attached to a sugar attached to three phosphate groups. And the reason for this is probably beyond the scope of this video, um, but two of those phosphate groups get removed as a pyrophosphate in the um, addition of nucleotides onto the chain, and that provides some of the energy required to create the phosphodiester bond between each nucleotide and the next nucleotide. So what we need to think about right now is just that we're putting in the raw materials that the polymerase is going to use to make a new strand of DNA, but you might, if you're going more deep into these concepts, you might want to think about the nucleosides versus nucleotides. Okay, so what is the book in this case? Well, um, that would be your template DNA. So in this case, it will be DNA that came from a plant or DNA that came from an insect or whatever it is you're trying to identify. So we have from part one, Dr. Pepinella just, uh, extracted DNA from a plant, from the leaf of a plant, and from a butterfly. So we'll continue talking about those as we go on today. So that's your template DNA, what you're actually trying to copy. And for bookmarks, again, this is also something that's in cell, uh, DNA replication inside of cells, and they're called primers. These are short segments of DNA that bind to a complementary region just on the edge of the barcode. And this is what tells the polymerase where to start copying, just like a bookmark might tell you where to start copying if I wanted you to copy part of a textbook. Um, so we design these um, and for barcoding, they're already designed. We know what we want to copy. So we know what primers work and they take advantage of our, uh, the way that bases pair up. So A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G. Um, and so these find the particular region that we're looking for. And then for electricity or environment, um, we put in a buffer into our PCR. So this helps control the pH. If you watched our bubbling liver video, um, you learned about how having too acidic of an environment can denature enzymes. Um, the same thing would happen to polymerase. If the pH wasn't maintained at the right level, uh, the polymerase would, could be denatured and wouldn't function properly. It also has cofactors that are required for the enzyme to work. Um, and some other things just to make sure the salt concentration and everything is perfect. We're kind of mimicking what the inside of a cell would be like where the polymerase would normally be functioning so that it will work really well inside of our little tiny plastic tube, which I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Okay, so back to our little diagram here. Um, and there's one more missing ingredient that, not really ingredient, but one more missing thing that I didn't talk about on that um, analogy which is that we have to change the temperature so that each of these steps in the PCR can happen. So there are three primary steps. And again, I'm gonna show you an animation in just a second that's gonna make these more clear. The first step is denaturation. That's gonna separate the two strands of DNA. So wherever you see the little blue uh, circle with a one inside, that's showing you this first step. We're denaturing the double strand of DNA. We need to only have a single strand of DNA as a template. Um, and remember that the two strands of DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are fairly weak, so this can occur at that 94 to 96 degrees Celsius temperature. Right, and then the next step is annealing, and this is specifically annealing of the primer to its complementary sequence in the genome. So you can see the little red primers where there's a circle that says number two, and they're just sticking onto a particular region of that single strand of DNA that we've generated uh, by having our denatured DNA. That happens at a lower temperature where those different bases will find their match and bind together. And then we have elongation. That takes place at about 72 degrees Celsius um, for TAC polymerase. There are slightly different polymerases available on the market. So if you are ever buying a polymerase for use in your classroom or your lab, you should just check what the manufacturer recommends to use. Usually it's 72 degrees Celsius. And that's where the polymerase is going to come in stick to the end of the primer and make a copy of everything after that primer for as long as it can. All right, so let's move on to our animation. So we have a lot of animations on our website, dnalc.cshl.edu slash resources. And I would highly recommend checking our resources page out if you're trying to understand a concept in molecular genetics 
because chances are we have an animation and I often find that the animations make things much more clear than hearing an explanation. Okay, so step one, the uh, sample is going to be heated up and hydrogen bonds holding the two strands of DNA together are going to be broken and the two strands are gonna be denatured or separated. Now the temperature is going to be lowered a bit and the primers are going to come in and find their complementary region. Now we use two primers when we do PCR so we can kind of bookend both sides of the DNA that we wanna copy. We wanna copy just one particular section. The temperature goes back up a bit to 72 degrees Celsius and this is where the little TAC polymerase shown here in this little blue thing is going to come in and make copies of all the nucleotides downstream. And you notice it didn't stop. This is called a chain reaction because we use the product of each step to do the next step. And as we denature again and our primers anneal again, what you'll see starting mostly in cycle three after this cycle is that we're going to start to accumulate just the piece that we want. In this case, just the barcode that we want. All right, so right now we're still gonna have some pieces that aren't quite the right size. But as we move on, here's cycle three, that, those red arrows are pointing to the parts we want. That's the barcode, just that little section. And now as we go on to cycle four and cycle five, uh, these are going to continue to accumulate. And then we're gonna see a graph here where the red line is total number of DNA copies and the blue line is target copies. So that's that little barcode region we want. And so since we end up, if we started with just one double-stranded piece of DNA, we end up with over a billion copies of that DNA um, if we do 30 cycles of PCR. We usually do something like 30 to 35 cycles, sometimes a little bit less depending on your application, um, but that's generally the number. So this isn't going to work perfectly in real life. Um, it's not actually every single time. Sometimes the primers are going to miss. Sometimes uh, the polymerase won't be able to bind to every single primer that's in the tube, especially if you get up to really high numbers of copies of DNA inside the tube. But you should still end up with many, many copies, millions or even billions of copies, because you're also not starting with just one double-stranded DNA. You're usually starting with a lot of DNA. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk a little bit more about PCR. So I mentioned before, we use a specific polymerase called TAC polymerase. And I put TAC here in italics. So you can think about why maybe I did that, what TAC might stand for. And uh, if you think about why we often in science put things in italics, it's because it's a genus and species name. Okay, so TAC stands for Thermus aquaticus. This is a type of bacteria that normally lives in hot springs. So it's a thermophile. And so we've purified, scientists have purified the polymerase from these bacteria and we use them in PCR. So think for a minute about what would happen if we use, say, a human polymerase. We can purify proteins out of human cells as well. That's not a problem for insect cells, plant cells, whatever it is. So why couldn't we use human cells, a human polymerase? Well, think about those steps in PCR. What's the very first step that we do? We heat the whole reaction of the whole tube gets heated up to something like 95 degrees Celsius. All right, that's over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that's really hot. Again, if you watch the bubbling liver video um, on DNA LC Live, or if you've learned about enzymes in your biology class, you probably have learned that heat can also denature proteins, including enzymes. So our cells, our proteins are not designed to work at 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 95 degrees Celsius. But since TAC, this Thermus aquaticus bacteria, uh, lives normally in hot springs, it actually works at these much higher temperatures. So its protein is not gonna be denatured. We don't have to keep adding more protein every time we heat up the tube. Um, so we use TAC polymerase. Um, it also works optimally at 72 degrees usually, like I said. And so that means that we can do these cycles of, of heating and cooling in a way that, that works really well for PCR. And another thing we can think about is how long should our primers be? I said they're short, uh, segments of DNA, I think. Um, but how short is short? Well, what we want our primers to do, right, is kind of bookend or bookmark the section of DNA that we're trying to copy. Okay, so they need to be long enough to bind only once in the genome. If our bookmarks are sticking all over the place, it's going to be really confusing to figure out what section we're supposed to be copying. 
if our primers are sticking all over the place, polymerase is going to bind all over the place and make lots of different copies. We're not going to end up with just one nice barcode region, that little target region in our animation. So that's what we want. We want our primers only to bind once in the genome. We want them to bind near each other so that we can make copies of that section. Um, there are a lot of different tools to design primers. I'm not going to talk about those today, but we might work that into a future video. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Um, but generally speaking, our primers are about 20 bases long. It's a little bit different depending on the exact application and the organism that they're in. Um, but about 20 nucleotides is usually what it works out to. You could actually do the math. If you knew how long the genome of an organism is, you could figure out how long would your primers have to be theoretically to only bind once in that number of base pairs. But remember that bases aren't distributed completely randomly and there are bits of chromosomes like you know, the telomeres that aren't exactly the same as the rest of the chromosome. So it ends up being about 20 base pairs works. Okay, so before I show you the actual lab stuff for PCR, um, I just want to explain a little bit more about why DNA barcoding works. So differences between species in their DNA allow us to identify the species. So here on the screen is what is actually a really good sample of um, a, a region of DNA that we could use for a barcode. It has about 70% conservation, meaning from one species to the next, about 70% of the bases are exactly the same. Um, so this makes it good for PCR. You can see kind of on the right hand side of the screen where there's a whole stretch of bases that are exactly the same in every species listed, species one through species six. So you could imagine that a PCR primer would be able to bind there to every single organism's DNA. And on the left side of our screen right now, what you're seeing is not exactly the same. Um, wherever there's a white spot means that there are different bases between each of the species. So if there are um, if the whole column is red, for example, that means that all of them have a T, and if it's white, that means that there's a difference. Um, but this is only showing us about 80 base pairs, and our barcodes are several hundred base pairs long. So you might be able to look a little bit further to the left if we imagined that the, the sequence went to the left of our screen um, and find a region where the primers would be able to bind to every single species of, say, plants or invertebrates or whatever it is that you were trying to bark. So this is what scientists did to figure out um, what sections to barcode. It's found regions of the genome that looked kind of like this, had about 70% conservation. And right, let me show you some examples that wouldn't be so good. So this sequence in the middle here, um, or just below the first one, is completely conserved. That'd be really great for doing PCR. Your primers would always be able to find their match. They would always find, you'd always get really nice amplification. But there's actually no useful information here if what we're trying to do is barcoding to identify a species, because every single species is the same. So if I, DNA, uh, if I barcode DNA from an unknown organism and I try to compare it here to this list, I'm not going to be able to tell if it's from species one, species two, species three, because they all look the same. There's no usable information for barcoding here. This might be a really good section to do PCR for some other purpose, but for the purposes of DNA barcoding, this is not very informative. There's no differences between the species. And then on the other hand, the third sequence I'm showing you here at the bottom has very little conservation. So this would be really hard or even impossible to do PCR on because there's no way that the primers are gonna be able to bind to every single species DNA. The primers have to find their complement and they have to be mostly matching. Sometimes they can match if there's one or two mismatches out of 20 but they need to be pretty well matched in order to consistently bind to this part of the DNA. So in this sequence, we wouldn't be able to do PCR. If we had this data from some other form of sequencing where we hadn't done PCR first, this would be great as a barcode because if I uh, found this data, generated this data somehow from an unknown organism, it's pretty likely that if it matches species four, that's the only species that matches. And I can be very confident that what I have is actually species four. Um, but this doesn't work for our traditional DNA barcoding methods that we're talking about today, where we extract DNA, do PCR, and sequence it. So hopefully that helps you understand how these genes were picked. This is why scientists came up with RBCL, with CO1, with the other genes that were listed on that previous slide. Okay. So 
Um, this uh, graphic at the top of the slide is from our DNA Barcoding 101 website, which is dnabarcoding101.org. We have a whole laboratory section that goes through some of our protocols and explains how to do them. Um, so I'm going to just quickly talk about this slide, and then I'll show you some of my lab stuff that I brought home with me. So we need to add all of the stuff that we need for PCR into our tube. So we need to add our primer mix. We need to add our DNA. And what we use often for barcoding, I'm going to stop sharing this so that you can see my screen better. Maybe if I can get my cursor to work. There we go. Nope. All right. So what we often use for barcoding are what we call in our beads, ready to go beads. I can get them out of the bag. So these are commercially available. Um, I have them in this little silver packet with a desiccant because we don't want the beads to be exposed uh, to any moisture. So I'm gonna try to show you here in the video. Hopefully you can see that there are little tiny white beads in the bottom of these very small tubes, okay? And so what these beads contain are polymerase, um, they have all the components of buffer, but they're just in a dry solid form. Um, and they have DNTP, so they have the nucleotides that need to be uh, used in PCR. So we need to add to that our primers and our DNA. Now, if you were barcoding a whole bunch of plants, you would use the same primers for every plant if you were doing RBCL for all of them. Um, same thing if you were barcoding a whole bunch of insects, you would use CO1 for all of your different insects. So you could make a primer mix ahead of time. So again, this is how we usually do this in the lab is we mix together our primers, actual pieces of DNA um, with uh, water and a pH indicator so that we can make sure that this bead is all set up. So I have somewhere over here, I have my primers and I just took a small amount out. We wanna keep the primers cold most of the time. So I just took a small amount into each of my tube, so I'll try to hold them up here. You can see it's kind of got a yellowy orange color. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. All right, and so this um, is the pH indicator, is that sort of orange color. And I'm going to do two different reactions, um, just like Dr. Pepinella did, so that we can carry on with a similar experiment. Now she already completed hers, and I'm gonna show you her results, but I wanna carry on as if we were doing the same thing. So I'm gonna just first label my tubes so I know which one is my plant, which one is my invertebrate? Okay. And now I'm going to use my micropipette to transfer 23 microliters of primer mix into the bead. So I have my pipette that has a range of 10 to 100 set like this. Two, zero, two, three, line zero. The line, remember, stands for the decimal point, so it's 23.0. I'm going to get a fresh pipette tip. I don't have any contamination, so I'm going to keep those closed. And into my tube for my plant, I'm going to put my RBCL primer mix. So I'm going to press down to the first stop. That's going to uh, release 23 microliters of air out of the pipette. So this is just like if you use an eyedropper. When you squeeze the bulb of the eyedropper, air comes out, and then it gets replaced either with air or with liquid if you put it into the liquid. That's how the micro pipettes work as well. So I'm going to press down to the first stop to let out 23 microliters of air. I'm going to put the pipette tip into my primer mix and release my thumb up. And that's going to draw up 23 microliters of my RBCL primer. And I'm going to add that to my bead. And I'll show you that in just a second. I'm going to get a new pipette tip though. And I'm going to do the same thing for my CO1 sample, for my invertebrate sample. We get a fresh pipette tip. I don't want to add the wrong primers into the opposite PCR. Now, it probably wouldn't hurt anything that much because um, the invertebrate doesn't have RBCL because it doesn't have chloroplast, but I still don't want any extra DNA in there that's going to interfere. All right, so I'm going to use my CO1 primers. Once again, pressing down to the first stop, going into the liquid, releasing my thumb. I'm going to add that to my second bead. Okay, get rid of my pipette tip. And now I will show you. Shut the window. 
So as the beads dissolve, the pH of the liquid changes because hopefully you can see this and it's not the same color as my shirt um, because of the components of the buffer. So the liquid should change to this pink color. You might be able to see some little tiny bubbles on top as the bead is dissolving. Those will go away over the next few seconds. Um, so I'm gonna set these down. Now I need to add my DNA. We don't need very much DNA to do PCR. Um, so remember that even if we started with one double-stranded piece of DNA, we would end up with billions of copies, over a billion copies. So we're just gonna add two microliters of our DNA. So I'm gonna set my smaller pipette that goes up to 10 to 0, 2, 0, 0. Sorry, I should have set these ahead of time. There we go. All right, so that's set to two microliters. And I'm gonna use my other pipette to set this micro pipette. And now what I want to tell you about the DNA. So because I also did a rapid DNA extraction, just like Dr. Papanella, there's still this little Wattman paper disc inside of my tube. That's fine. So if you think back to what she did in the part one video, we put, we lysed the cells, we put a Wattman paper disc into the tube to, to bind the DNA in the presence of the right conditions so that salt bridges would be formed between the DNA and the Wattman paper. We washed the sample to get rid of contaminants. And then we used TE buffer, which is mostly water, um, but with a little bit of buffer and capacity to break down those salt bridges and release the DNA from the disc. And then we just leave these tubes in a refrigerator overnight or for several days, and that helps get all of the DNA off of the disc. All right, so that's what I've done as well. So you can probably see here, there's still a little disc inside of my tube with the liquid. I don't need to remove that disc. I'm just going to use my pipette and again, press down to the first step. I'm just gonna try not to stab right onto the disc. I'm just gonna try to put my pipette in the liquid and release my thumb. My only concern with stabbing onto the disc is I might not draw off the right amount of liquid if the disc is sort of preventing the liquid from entering the pipette. All right, and I always tell my students, make sure you can visually see that you have two microliters of DNA here in your pipette tip. It's not very much, but it's enough that you should be able to see it. Sometimes people think, oh, two microliters is so small, I'm not even gonna be able to see it. But that's not true. If you look here at the end of the pipette, you should be able to see that there is two microliters of liquid there. So I'm gonna add my plant DNA into my plant tube. I'm just gonna add it right into that primer and bead mix. Pressing all the way down to the second stop, which lets out a little bit of extra air and helps make sure all of the DNA comes out of my pipette tip and into my tube. All right, now I'm going to do the same thing for my inverter sample. And just like with my plant sample, I have a little disc in there. Um, I don't care about that. I'm just going to go right next to the disc, take up two microliters of liquid, and throw my tube on the floor. That's fine. Um, and add the DNA to the PCR mix. OK. There we go are ready. Now, uh, for the thermocycling program, we actually use an instrument called a thermocycler. So this is what's going to change the temperatures. The one that I brought home with me from the lab, um, so I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I'm based in our New York City locations, and I'm coming to you from my apartment in New York City, which is kind of small. So I was trying to bring home the smallest equipment that I had available to me. So I brought home this mini PCR thermocycler. It's very small. If you've watched any of our other DNALC live videos, or if you have visited us um, in person at one of our DNA Learning Center locations, you probably used a much larger thermocycler. Um, but this one works the same way. So I'm just going to open up the lid so you can also see inside. Um, this only holds 16 samples, so it's not ideal for like a whole class. But what it has is a heating block here, and the lid is also heated. So when I put my samples in here, close it up, um, it gets programmed actually by my laptop in this case. On many of the larger thermocyclers, we program them right on the machine itself. So I'm gonna put my samples in here and I'm not gonna run it right now because I don't have easy access to an outlet at this table. So I'm just gonna set those in there. And when I'm done with this video, I will plug this in and I'll run a program from my laptop um, that will go through these uh, temperatures. So let me see if I can get the screen share back up so you can see that. 
There we go, showing. All right, so that machine is actually going to go through um, each of those temperatures. It's going to heat up to 94 degrees for 30 seconds to allow all the DNA to be denatured. It's going to cool down to 54 degrees for these primers um, for about 45 seconds, and that's going to allow the primers to anneal. And then it's going to heat back up to 72 degrees Celsius for 45 seconds. And that will allow the polymerase to extend the copies of DNA, the copying of DNA. And then at the end, we're going to hold this at four degrees Celsius, which is about the temperature that most refrigerators are at. Um, if we're going to do the next step pretty quickly, or you could put it in a freezer that's at around minus 20 degrees Celsius for longer term storage. Um, but for now, I'm not going to do that step. I just wanted to mention that when you're done with the PCR, you shouldn't just leave the DNA at room temperature. It's not quite as stable there. Okay, so as I said, I also have the samples that Dr. Pepinella uh, said, uh, sorry, she didn't actually send me the sample. She sent me a picture of her results and I will do my samples later because this program, if you kind of look at it and see it goes 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 45 seconds, that has to be repeated 35 times. And there's a little step at the beginning and end that also help. Um, so that takes about an hour and a half to two and a half hours. We obviously don't wanna just sit here and wait. So we're gonna proceed as if we've already done that step. Now, when this is done and we have millions or billions of copies of our DNA, um, we need to be able to tell whether we copied the right thing. So the next step of DNA barcoding, um, the next kind of major step at least, is DNA sequencing. And in part three of this series, DNA barcoding, um, we will talk a lot more about sequencing and how that works. But what I'll tell you right now is that it costs some money and it takes some time and so we don't want to proceed with samples that, that aren't going to work. We also just generally don't want to keep proceeding with samples that aren't going to work, because if we need to redo something, we want to do that sooner than later, right? So what we're going to do next, in order to tell if we have the right copies in our tube, if we have our DNA barcode inside of our tube at this point, is something called gel electrophoresis, okay? So again, I have from our DNA barcoding 101 site some of the steps written up there. And I've already done the first part, which was to heat up our agarose gel, um, which is sort of like making gel. Agarose is a sugar that comes from a seaweed. And we've heated that up. And then I poured it into a little mold and made a gel. And I have just an example gel here for you. And after about 20 minutes, it's set. So I'm gonna hold this up to the screen you can see. We also put a comb inside of the gel that makes these little pockets here at the top. All right, those are called wells. That's where we're actually going to put our DNA when we're done with the PCR um, so that we can run our gel electrophoresis and see the results. Now, because of the way I have everything set up here and my camera is a little bit far away, it's gonna be hard for me to show you the loading um, right now live. So I have a recording of a gel loading that's taken from above. So hopefully you can see um, a little bit better what that looks like. But you can also see in this uh, picture at the top of the screen, um, we're going to load six microliters. We don't want to use all of the sample because we need to preserve some of it to actually send for DNA sequencing. Um, so we're going to run six microliters on our gel. Um, and let me just show you that video first, and then I'll talk about how this actually works. I believe that's on my next slide. Okay. So I took this video from above. You can see my reflection a little bit. So here I'm just putting the pipette tip with six microliters of DNA um, into the well. I'm not stabbing all the way through the bottom of the gel, but I'm making sure I actually go into the, that little space where the well is. So in the next sample that I'm about to load here in the video, you'll see there's a little bit of dye stuck to the outside of my pipette tip. And you see that that all spreads out over the buffer. Now I did that on purpose so you can see kind of what would happen if you didn't get your DNA all the way into the well. It would just float away on top. And that wouldn't allow us to actually see our results. So let me show you here what we do with the gel before we load it. So again, I brought home with me a small um, version of our lab equipment, which is this blue gel here. So the gel is actually gonna go inside of this chamber and then it has a power button down here. So I'm gonna set the gel in. And we'll imagine that I'm about to load it right now. So the gel just sits inside of that chamber. All right, so I'm going to set my gel 
inside of the gel chamber. Now what's going to happen when I'm done uh, loading it, as you just saw in that video, is we're gonna put an electric current through the gel. Now think about what the components of DNA are. We have our base, we have our sugar, we have our phosphate group. One of those has a charge. If you've been watching our other videos where we talked about the structure of DNA, um, you may have learned that we have a negative charge on our DNA. So um, the negative charge of the DNA means that we want to run our electric current so that the negative charge pushes the DNA into the gel down uh, towards the positive electrodes. So our DNA, if I was holding the gel this way, would run from top to bottom, away from the wells. Okay. Now, what I have set up right now, just this gel surrounded by air, um, is anything going to happen if we turn on that electric current? Probably not. All right, so um, I have here some TBE buffer that stands for Tris Bore EVTA. And this is a liquid, it's mostly water, and it has uh, some buffer in it. I'm just going to pour that over my gel, and that's going to conduct the electricity so that the electricity will actually run through the gel and um, push the, gel, the DNA down into the agarose. Now, the reason for this is that we want to separate our DNA by size. All right, so imagine I had to put my DNA here. It's hard to see on the screen, so I'm just not even going to do it right now. I would put this top on, I would plug this in. Again, I just don't have an outlet right here, but imagine that I plug this into the power supply and I would turn it on. And this negative charge is going to push the DNA into the gel. And the gel is made out of this sugar. And there are little spaces in between the sugar. It's like a matrix. And so the DNA that is small will move through that matrix more quickly than the DNA that's a larger size. So um, you can imagine that this is like being in a traffic jam. If you're on a bicycle or a motorcycle or something, a scooter, you can quickly wiggle your way through traffic. It might not be illegal, but you could do that, right? You could go between the cars, you could find little spaces and you can move further away. So the DNA works the same way, right? Um, and the bigger pieces of DNA are gonna have a much harder time finding a gap that they can fit through. So just like a large truck might be stuck in traffic more so than a motorcycle, those ones are gonna stay closer to the well, right? So we're gonna separate our DNA by size. And this is gonna help us determine whether when we made copies of DNA by PCR, uh, whether those copies are the right size, whether we think we actually copied a barcode. All right, so I'm going to go back to my slides. Let's see, and give you an example, and then also show you the results from Dr. Peppinella. So let me play that. Okay. Here's the next slide. Ah, I forgot to mention this part. That's very important when you're loading gels. One thing that's very important is you should always have a map for yourself of where you put your sample. So in science, we want to keep a good lab notebook. We want to keep track of what we're doing. I can't tell you how many times I have thought, I'm going to remember this. And then 10 minutes later, I totally forgot. Maybe you've done the same thing. So you might want to draw a little map for yourself of where you loaded your samples on your agarose gel. So oh, I've loaded this gel for how I would do this in an ideal world. All right, so the L all the way on the left stands for ladder. So a DNA ladder or a molecular weight marker is something we often include on the gel. It's sort of like um, a, a set of standards that you're going to compare your DNA to. So these are pieces of DNA that are commercially available. They're all mixed together. Um, and we know how big each of those pieces is. So we know that the one that runs the furthest down the gel, the smallest piece here, um, is 100 base pairs long. And it goes up to a little bit above 1,000 in the case that we're using today. So that's going to tell us if your DNA was 100 base pairs long, it would move this far with the 100 base pair band. All right, now the, the way I've loaded, uh, labeled this gel picture here is a little bit different than what we have from Dr. Peppinella, but you can see I put P for plant, I for invertebrate. All right, that's pretty straightforward. Those are the samples that I just set up here and that we imagine that I ran in my thermocycler and loaded onto my gel. And that's actually what Sharon did. Now I also put P plus and I plus and P minus and I minus. What do you think those might be? So something else we wanna include in when we do a scientific experiment are controls. All right, so the pluses here 
are positive controls. So this would be DNA that you know works for this type of PCR so that you can make sure if your PCR doesn't work for your new sample, it wasn't a problem with the polymerase or with the primers or something like that. So remember, you're gonna have leftover in your tube, you're gonna have still some DNA left after you've done your PCR. You can save this DNA in the freezer, and if this one works, you could keep using that DNA as a positive control. That's what we do in the lab. So it's good to include positive controls in the PCR. Now, when we use the PCR beads, usually there's not too much problem um, with the polymerase going bad, as long as you see that pH color change, uh, usually there's not a problem with the buffer either. But you can also do PCR not with the beads, but by buying each of those components separately and pipetting them together. And then it's a little bit more likely that one of your individual reagents will have gone bad, or that you just messed up when you made uh, the, the reaction to put the reaction together. It happens, we're all human, right? Um, and then our negative controls. So ideally, when you do a PCR, you also want to include a negative control. And this is to make sure there was nothing in your water, your primer mix. Again, not so much of a problem with your beads, but if you were using free nucleotides that you had just dissolved um, in water to begin with, you want to make sure there's no contaminant in there that runs on the gel at the same size um, as your barcode that you're trying to amplify. So the negative control would be all of the things that are in the PCR except your template DNA. So you actually don't expect to see anything in these lanes, um, but it's a good idea to include them when you do PCR. I don't have them in the results picture that I'm gonna show you, um, but you can imagine that they're there. If you were doing a real experiment, this one's just for demonstration, you'd wanna include your controls as well, just to make sure everything works um, as well as possible. Okay, so what we're going to see are each of the pieces of DNA are going to be glowing. And I forgot to mention, I didn't put it in this gel that I used as an example, but we usually put a dye inside of the gel that's going to stick to DNA and it's gonna fluoresce when it's exposed to a UV light or a blue LED light. Um, the one that I like to use, the one that I would use for this experiment, and I believe the same one that Dr. Peppinelli used is called Cyber Safe. It's gonna fluoresce kind of a green color. If you watch um, uh, one of our other PCR videos, you might've seen some with gel red that fluoresces kind of a nice pink color. Um, there's different stains available on the market. So we include that in this case in our gel, it's gonna stick to our DNA and anywhere where there's DNA, you'll see a glowing spot. Okay, let's move on. So this is an example gel. I'm just gonna go through this very quickly to explain how we might troubleshoot for things that went wrong. And then I'll show you Dr. Papanella's results and we'll wrap up for the day. So you can see on the left, the ladder that starts down at the bottom from 100 and goes up to about 1,000 base pairs. Um, and in this case, the barcode that we're looking for, RBCL, is about 750 base pairs long, what we expect to see. So in lane one, you see actually a really nice example of a PCR that worked, that black band that's in between the 700 and 800 uh, base pair ladder band is what we want. And then you see down at the bottom, there's this sort of dark gray, but a little bit lighter than the bands oval. All right, and we're representing it that way because there's another bit of DNA that's in all of your lanes. Can you think of what that other piece of DNA would be or pieces of DNA? You're gonna have a little bit of the genomic DNA, but that's gonna be really big. But this is our primers. So remember those are about 20 base pairs long. So they're gonna run much faster even than the 100 base pair. We don't always see them. It depends how bright your stain is and how many primers you actually put into the tube. But we often see this sort of fuzzy little primer band at the bottom of the gel. All right, so number one looks great. This one I would send for sequencing. All right, how about number two? We see the barcode that we expect. And we don't really see the primers down at the bottom. I wouldn't be too worried about this if I saw this in one of my classes because maybe the reaction just used up all the primers um, and there just wasn't that much primer left in the tube. So we just can't visualize it on the gel. All right, now number three and number four. Take a look at those and think about what went wrong. These don't look like number one and number two, right? So we don't see that, that barcode band where we expect it at 750 base pairs. So what do you think could have gone wrong here? I actually think two different things went wrong if this was a real gel. So number three, I think what's most likely is actually a gel loading error. So probably when this student, if this was a student gel or this person, um, when they loaded their sample into the gel, they either stabbed their pipette tip all the way through the bottom of the gel and the DNA went underneath the gel and didn't go through the matrix and accumulate in one spot. 
or they did what I showed you in that video where the DNA all dispersed on the top like my dye did um, and none of it fell down into the well. All right, so for number three, if I saw this in a class, I would probably run a few more microliters on a gel because it might have worked. We can't actually tell on this gel. So we don't know if the PCR worked or not. So we would just run a little bit more in the gel. We don't need that much of the DNA to send for sequencing. So it's no problem. We would just rerun this gel. Now, how about number four? Do we think that number four is also a gel loading error? Well, there's something different between number three and number four. And maybe you've noticed this as well. Number four, we can actually see the primers down there at the bottom. So I don't think this is a gel loading error. I think person number four here actually got their DNA into the well uh, because we can see the primers at the bottom. So where else did they come from? They came from the well. Um, and I think their PCR just didn't work. Now, sometimes when we talk about PCR, I think we make it sound like it's just super easy and all you have to do is pipette these things and put it in the thermocycler and everything will work. There's actually a lot of things that can go wrong in PCR and many people have spent many hours troubleshooting PCR that didn't work. So there's some really obvious possibilities or obvious to me anyway. Um, maybe you can think of some as well. Maybe they didn't even put any DNA in there too. That's why I emphasized a lot, make sure you see those two microliters of DNA in the end of your pipette tip. I find a lot of times students are nervous about pipetting and they don't actually get two microliters. So maybe there was just no DNA, no template DNA to begin with. That would make it so that you didn't have anything to copy and you wouldn't end up with a barcode band. It's also possible if you think about the steps of DNA extraction, remember how we were washing the DNA with an ethanol based buffer? Um, that was to try and get rid of some of the contaminants, some of the other stuff. Sometimes that other stuff that came from the cell or especially if your sample came from somewhere where there was some soil on it, so some, some plant that came from the ground or an insect that was on the ground, if you got some soil into your sample, a lot of times there are things there that will interfere with the polymerase. And your PCR just won't work. So it's a little bit hard to tell right now whether which one of those things happened. So if the student or the person who did this PCR thought, maybe I didn't actually put any DNA in my tube, um, we would probably want to just rerun this. PCR. But if they thought, I know that I got two microliters of DNA in the tube, then you'd probably want to redo the DNA extraction. You might want to try a different method. So if you had done rapid, you might want to try silica if you're able to do that, or use one of the commercial kits if you have access to those, um, or maybe just retry from a different part of the organism, especially with um, insects. Sometimes there are bits of them that just have so much exoskeleton, you don't get as much DNA. So this person would need to step back um, and redo their PCR. All right, now how about number five? This one's a little weird. They have a band, but it's not quite the right size. So in this case, that's probably something that contaminated the reaction. Um, and we would probably wanna start over with this one as well, because that's probably not RBCL. Now, sometimes from one species to the next, there's a little bit of size difference in the barcode, but usually not as big of a difference as we see here that that one's down around 400. So we'd probably wanna try again for number five as well. Number six is also interesting. We see two bands and one, they look like they're about the right size. There's a couple of different reasons why this result could have happened. Um, but the important thing to note, and again, we'll talk more about sequencing in part three of this series. Um, this would not work well for DNA sequencing. So you wouldn't wanna send the DNA in this tube as is. You might be able to purify just the band that's the right size um, and send that for sequencing, but otherwise you would wanna start over probably from DNA extraction because what may have happened here is that you got two different sources of DNA in your tube and their gene was a little bit different size. There's other possibilities as well, um, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna leave it at that, that we wouldn't wanna send this sample directly for sequence. All right, last example, number seven. We see this sort of light gray band and we don't see our primer band. So it's possible that this was a gel loading error that they just didn't get the whole sample down into their well, um, but it's also possible that the PCR just didn't work very well. So in this case, it's kind of a judgment card. You would have to decide, um, do you wanna send this for sequencing? It might work, it might not. So sometimes you're in a hurry and you really need results before a poster presentation or before some sort of presentation. Um, and you might wanna just try it and see what happens. Um, other times you might not wanna spend that money on sequencing. You might go back and redo some of the steps in this particular sample and try to get a better result. But it might work, it might not. I would be inclined probably just to send it for sequencing. You might not have the funds available for multiple rounds of sequencing, so that might not be possible for you. And that's fine. You would just have to decide based on your particular circumstances 
what you want to do here. Okay, so this is the picture of the gel that Dr. Papanilla sent me. You can see her RBCL is a nice bright band. There's a little bit of DNA up higher, not too worried about that. Um, you can also see the kind of dark purple color. That's the dye that helps the DNA sink down into the well. And you can see her butterfly line, her CO1 sample is a really beautiful, clean one line. CO1 is a little bit bigger than RBCL. That's why it's a little bit closer to the wells at the top of your screen. All right, so we'll talk more about what the next step for this is for DNA sequencing in part three of our DNA barcoding series. So I hope you have enjoyed this series so far. I wanna mention a couple of other things right here really quickly. Um, so on our website, we now have a section that is called online programs that has all of our DNA LC live stuff, as well as virtual lab field trips that can be booked for classes. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. There's also a resources section that has all these wonderful animations, some other videos that explain concepts really visually, and I think in a really nice way. I mentioned throughout the presentation that we have a partnership with Carolina Biological. Their website is listed here at the bottom of the screen. If you search using DNA barcodes to identify and classify living things, you'll find our silica DNA extraction kit. Um, you'll also find that they sell primers for some of these common DNA barcoding regions. I think they sell both RBCL and CO1 for use in classrooms. And then at the very bottom of the screen are our social media handles. Um, if you're enjoying this, if there's something in particular you would like us to do on DNALC Live, I really encourage you to reach out to us on one of those channels and give us an idea of what you would like to see next, because we're here to do this for you. Um, so we want to do whatever it is you want to see, as long as it kind of fits in the world of DNA. Um, so make sure that you're subscribed to our YouTube channel if you're not already. You can turn on alerts so you don't miss any DNALC Live presentations. And uh, we are tweeting and Instagramming and Facebooking about all of these things as well. So follow us there and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Have a good day.